Greetings. I am Dr. Graciela Canedo Livingston, Provost at Nebraska Wesleyan University. I want to welcome you to this year's presentation of Spooky Evenings. We here at Nebraska Wesleyan are excited and proud of this event that brings together scholars, artists, authors, and filmmakers to discuss the topic of horror in its various manifestations across the arts and the humanities. Professor Juan Jose Castaño Marquez and Dr. Matthew Jarvis have been working tirelessly to bring you the best scholarship in the field of horror through this unparalleled digital humanities event. I would like to acknowledge the generous support from the Nebraska Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment that helps make quality programming like spooky evenings possible. Again, welcome and enjoy this presentation of Spooky Evenings. <laughs> Tonight on Spooky Evenings, an interview with Lisa Morton. And we're live. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Halloween, happy All Hallowtide, and happy Samhain, and welcome to Lisa Morton. Thanks, and I'm happy to be here on All Hallows Tide or Samhain or whatever you want to call it. All <laughs> Uh, many, many titles like yourself. Uh, I'm just going to stick with the queen of Halloween. I think that's the, uh, the consensus of everyone I've talked to about you. So, uh, I'll accept that title. <laughs> you get a sash. Right. Uh, so you're going to talk to us here a little bit about, uh, Halloween as a concept and idea, and then uh, we're going to have a conversation, uh, followed up, uh, from, from your presentation. Perfect. So I'll invite you to share your screen and uh, start at your leisure. Okay, here we go then. All right. First of all, thank you again, Matthew, for inviting me to this. And um, it's really, I have never done this presentation on Halloween itself, which is kind of fun and exciting. So we are going to start by talking about why I call Halloween the most misunderstood holiday. Um, you know, when we talk about it, how many of us really know its history or even what that name means? If you look at our other holidays, they're all a lot easier here to understand. We all know the basic history of Thanksgiving, for example, or the purpose of Christmas or why New Year's is called New Year's, but what about Halloween? Let us start with its history. A lot of you have probably heard that it was based on an ancient Celtic holiday, and you may have heard that the holiday was devoted to the worship of Samhain, a lord of death. Well, okay, let's dismantle this one bit by bit. First off, despite the number of Halloween stories that have also cleverly fictional characters named Sam Samhain, um, including the 2007 movie Trick or Treat, the actual pronunciation is Samhain. And the word is not the name of a lord of death, but instead translates to summer's end. Now, October 31st was actually the new, the new Year's celebration for the Celts. It was when they brought their livestock in from the fields and got ready for their long, hard winter. 
that was just around the corner. But before we go any farther, let's just talk a little bit about who these Celts were. Now, the Celts were actually a loose conglomeration of tribes found all throughout Europe and the British Isles. Because they did not believe in writing down their own history, they handed everything down orally. We don't know as much about the Celtic tribes as we do about many other ancient peoples, but from archaeological evidence and history recorded by Roman and Catholic scribes, we know that they were far from wild savages, despite the way they are often portrayed. They were, for example, very skilled at making roads and working with metals. And yes, it seems possible that they did engage in human sacrifice, but it was probably considered a great honor to be chosen for sacrifice to their gods. Now, when we talk about the Celts celebrating Samhain, we are specifically talking about the Irish Celts because they are the ones who have the most historical records, thanks to the Catholic missionaries who arrived in Ireland around the 6th century AD. Now, while it's possible that other Celtic peoples also celebrated sound, the truth is we just don't know. Among the many mis mistaken notions of the Celts is the idea that they built Stonehenge, but it actually dates back to the much earlier Neolithic age. And it was also popular among 19th century historians to believe that the Celts held frenzied religious rites, as you see in this 19th century engraving. That's really a fantasy on the part of those Victorian historians. What we do know is that the Celts thought Samhain as the border between two years was a time when the veil between worlds was at its thinnest. And on that night, fairies might cross over into our world. Now, when we say fairies, or as the Celts knew them, the she, we're not talking cute Disney-like little sprites like these. No, we are talking terrible creatures like this, the banshee, the fairy that wails to mark a death. Banshee, by the way, actually translates to female fairy in the Celtic tongue. Now, some of the way the Celts celebrated Samhain will sound familiar. They held parties with special foods and they told ghost stories like this one about the hero Finn McCool, who was protecting the Celts palace on Samhain from marauding fairies who burned it down every October 31st. In another really spooky Samhain story, the hero Nira is sent by the king on Samhain night to put a loop around the ankle of a dead criminal whose body is still hanging from the gallows. But the corpse comes to life when Nira tries. Now, this Celtic love of ghost stories and eerie happenings on Samhain is surely where Halloween acquired its macabre side from. So, how did we get from a New Year's celebration at the end of summer to the idea that Samhain was the name of a Lord of Death? Well, for that, we have to thank an 18th century surveyor named Charles Valency, who came to Ireland sometime around 1770. Now, Valency became obsessed with Celtic lore and history and recorded thousands and thousands of words into his six-volume Celectania de Rebus Hibernicus. Now, there was just one problem with all of this. Valency was an inept historian who was denounced by his own peers as someone who, quote unquote, wrote more nonsense than any man of his time. Now, Valency arbitrarily decided that Samhain did not mean summer's end, and instead he traced the word back to an ancient Indian deity with a similar name. And from there, in a series of logic leaps that are frequently nearly impossible to follow, he decided that Samhain was the name of a lord of death. Even though this is a complete fabrication, Valency's books found their way into libraries all over the world. And thus was born the notion that Halloween is based on the worship of an ancient evil pagan god. So what about the holiday's modern name, Halloween? Do you know exactly what it means? Let's break this one down. First off, this is where the Catholic side of the holiday comes into play. Pope Gregory III, who is seen here, was the one who established a Catholic doctrine called syncretism, 
which suggest, suggested that rather than try to aggressively stamp out existing religions and celebrations, Catholic missionaries would achieve faster conversion if they incorporated those existing practices into Catholicism. So when it came to the Celts, they took an existing holiday, All Saints Day, and they moved it from its original date of May 13th to November 1st. Since the Celts started their festivals at sundown on the night before the day, this meant that All Saints Day started as soon as the sun vanished on October 31st. So how do we get from All Saints Day to Halloween? The first thing that you have to know is that hollow was an old name for saint. So now we've got All Hallows Eve. And Halloween is really just a short way of saying Hollow's Evening. By the way, the name was originally spelled with an apostrophe, as you see here. This is uh, the first cover of uh, the cover of the first full history of the holiday, written by a librarian named Ruth Edna Kelly in 1919, which means that even into the 20th century, it was still proper to spell Halloween with that apostrophe between the two E's. That didn't really start to disappear until about 10 years after Kelly's book. So now let's talk about our favorite Halloween icons. Surely no Halloween image is more beloved than the jack-o'-lantern, that carved pumpkin that warms up porches all over America on Halloween night. How did this grinning gourd come to be associated with Halloween? Well, let's look at the folklore first. There are legends all over the world of a trickster named Jack who outwits this guy. Yep, Jack scams the devil not once, but three times. When Jack finally dies, he can't get into heaven, but the devil doesn't want him in hell either. Finally, the devil kind of reluctantly tosses Jack, uh, Jack's spirit a burning ember from the hell fires, which Jack places into a carved gourd and uses to light his way as his spirit eternally roams the earth. Now, in Ireland, Halloween was often associated with pranks, and one of the most beloved was carving Jack's face into a large turnip. These might be placed on Halloween night just around a dark corner where that glowing face would be sure to give any passers-by a fright. They might think it was Jack the Trickster. When the Irish came to America in the 1840s to escape famine, they brought their traditions with them and soon realized that the American pumpkin made for an even better jack-o'-lantern. But one other thing had to happen though to confirm that carved pumpkin as the real king of Halloween. In 1820, a short story by Washington Irving called The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which of course features the headless horseman who hurls his jack-o'-lantern head at Ichabod Crane. Now, even though the original story contains no direct reference to Halloween, it became standard reading for the holiday, and by the beginning of the 20th century, the pumpkin had taken its rightful place atop the Halloween pantheon. And now in the 21st century, we still love our jack-o'-lanterns, including, of course, sexy pumpkin. So what about the other icons of Halloween, the witch and the black cat? For the backstory of the witch, we have to get a little bit political. In the 1590s, King James, and yes, this is the same King James who gave us the King James Bible, was the ruler of Scotland. It, it, James was both obsessed with witches and was anxious to distance himself from the Catholic Church. Now, before James, witches had never been linked to Halloween. But under James, his inquisitors begin extracting confessions from accused witches calling All Saints Eve one of the great witch Sabbaths. From that point on, witches were linked to the holiday, although again, it took a famous 19th century short story to really confirm that pairing. Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is about a young man who discovers that everyone in his town is a witch. Now, as with the legend of Sleepy Hollow, this story has become a much read Halloween classic. However, prior to 1939, Halloween witches often didn't look quite the way we picture them now. They, for example, were often dressed in red or white. So what happened in 1939 to change that image forever? 
Yep. The Wizard of Oz. After that movie, our image of the witch as a black hatted and green skinned crone would be enshrined for good. So for the last of our Halloween icons, let's talk about the black cat. Now, although cats certainly have a pre-existing association with witches, once again, it took a famous short story to make them a major part of Halloween. Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. As with the legend of Sleepy Hollow, The Black Cat contains no mention at all of Halloween, but this terrifying tale became a holiday standard. Now, before we move on to some more modern Halloween traditions, let's just talk about the colors of Halloween. You might be surprised to learn that black and orange were not always the favorite Halloween colors. Early 20th century decorating guides tell us that the traditional colors of Halloween are yellow and brown, colors associated with harvest, which happens around the time of Halloween. However, between the orange pumpkin and the black cat by about 1920, Halloween's colors were firmly established. So let's go on to trick or treat. We all love it. It's also one of the parts of the holiday that is the least understood. I've heard people suggest, for example, that it goes all the way back to the Celts, as you can see from this rather fanciful comic strip from a religious track. In truth, there is absolutely no tie between the Celts and trick-or-treat. Trick-or-treat is also sometimes said to have sprung from two British traditions. Now, the first of these is called souling. Souling was practiced on November 2nd, which is All Souls Day, and it involved beggars and later on young people dressed as beggars going from house to house and offering to say prayers for the souls of those trapped in purgatory in exchange for small cakes, which were called soul cakes. The other tradition is Guy Fox Day, which is still celebrated in Great Britain on November 5th. Guy Fox Day commemorates a failed attempt by the group you see here in 1605 to assassinate King James. Yes, that same King James again by blowing up parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder hidden in the basement. Now, even though Guy Fox was not the true leader of this conspiracy, he was the guy caught with the gunpowder on November 5th. So every year thereafter, the British celebrated the foiled gunpowder treason with traditions like making effigies of Guy Fox that were burned in bonfires. To collect supplies for the bonfires and money for the fireworks, kids might smear suit on their faces and go out begging, which is a little like trick-or-treat, but again, there is really no direct tie. No, what leads right into trick-or-treat is instead prank playing. Now, we've already mentioned that the Irish brought their holiday traditions with them to America, and one of the Halloween rituals was prank playing, which soon became popular with boys throughout America. Originally, the pranks were silly things like knocking on windows or stealing a gate. In fact, stealing gates was so popular that the holiday was called gate night in some areas. Disassembling things and reassembling them elsewhere was a favorite trick, like this vintage postcard from 1909 that shows a small town in Iowa the morning after Halloween. Now, the pranksters have moved everything from buggies to bathtubs and filled up Main Street with them. However, as the pranks moved into American cities in the 1930s, they became more destructive. The pranksters were setting fires and breaking windows and causing millions of dollars of damage. By 1933, the pranks had become vandalism on a massive scale. In fact, that year, many newspapers dubbed it Black Halloween and many cities were considering banning the holiday altogether. Fortunately, a few civic-minded citizens suggested that buying these kids off with parties might be more successful, so cities started putting out pamphlets on how to hold Halloween parties. They suggested giving the kids simple costumes because, hey, kids love to dress up, and giving them some games to play and some treats, and hey, guess what? Vandalism rates at Halloween declined sharply, by 1936, the phrase trick or treat was reported in national magazines and the practice spread across America. 
It had to take a little hiatus during World War II because of sugar shortages. But when the war ended, trick or treat exploded in popularity, driven in part by retailing. Mom no longer would have to spend all day making costumes and treats. Now she could buy the kids mass produced costumes and candy. For the next 20 years, trick or treat was happily practiced all over America. But then in the 1960s and 70s, it took a couple of big hits when reports began to surface of razor blades and apples and poisoned candy. It didn't even matter that the idea of poisoned candy came from an incident in 1974 when Ronald O'Brien poisoned his own son by putting arsenic in a pixie stick all in a scheme to claim insurance money. No, Americans had totally bought into the notion of anonymous psychos out to wreak havoc on their kids' Halloween candy at the same time, adults were starting to reclaim the holiday in other ways. LGBTQ groups and pagan communities were celebrating Halloween in some pretty spectacular new ways. In 1978, Halloween's conversion to a night for adults got yet another push with the release of one movie. Yes, John Carpenter's Halloween, which removed all semblance of magic or fun from the holiday and instead told the whole world it was too darn scary for kids. So as the holiday began to morph into an adult festival, it needed to find new ways to scare grown-ups. In the 1960s, nonprofit organizations like the JCs had great success staging haunted houses, which would consist of a maze full of costumed actors and stage scenes. In 1973, the idea of Halloween haunted houses took a big leap forward when the Southern California amusement park Knott's Berry Farm decided to try filling their slow autumn days with a Halloween makeover and Knott's Scary Farm was born. The seasonal redo turned out to be hugely successful, and by the 1980s, Knott's was not only offering dozens of mazes and live entertainment for their Halloween seasons, they also inspired other amusement parks to do the same. Universal Studios followed, offering haunted attractions based not just on their own classic monster movies, but on famous horror properties from other studios as well, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Haunting of Hill House, and The Exorcist. By the year 2000, the haunted attractions industry had become a multi-billion dollar field, and there are now over 3,000 Halloween haunted attractions spread across the U.S. every year. In fact, some of them have become so successful that they are moving into offering frights in other holidays and even going year-round. A lot of homeowners started looking at all these haunted houses and wishing they could do their own small versions in their own front yard. So in 1984, a smart guy named Joe Marber had the idea of catering to these home haunts with a seasonal pop-up store called Spirit Halloween. There are now more than a thousand Spirit Halloween stores popping up in the late summer every year, offering everything from bags of fake cobwebs to fully audio on animatronic figures like Beetlejuice. One good offshoot of Halloween's transformation into an adult holiday was that historians and scholars also started to take the observation more seriously. And in 1990, Leslie Pratt Bannatine's Halloween, an American holiday in American history, became the first serious study of Halloween released in 70 years. Now, it inaugurated a whole new cycle of Halloween books, including a wave of Halloween fiction, guidebooks to collecting on Halloween, serious academic studies, and the first encyclopedic reference on the holiday. So where is Halloween headed in the future? I get that question a lot. Well. First off, let me assure everyone that Halloween does have a future. During the 1918 flu pandemic, newspapers noted that the quote unquote Halloween observance here will be subdued but not destroyed. Uh, I believe that that will hold true for 2021, which is already on track to be the biggest Halloween ever in terms of retail sales and into the future as well. For the past 15 years or so, 
Halloween has been growing in popularity around the globe, especially in Europe, Japan, Australia, and even Russia and China. So I guess the last misconception I'd like to lay to rest here is the idea that Halloween is somehow starting to fade. The truth is that not only are those retail sales increasing every year, but the entire world has discovered that it loves costume kids and playful scares and all of those grinning orange jack-o'-lanterns. Thank you. It's funny. Uh, it's happened to me before, and it's happened to me again. Almost everything in my notes <laughs> uh, was touched on. So um, I... I, I <laughs> Uh, my first question, I mean, uh, the what I think about, because I grew up in a rural area in the South. So, um, you know, I, I think there are three Baptist churches where my town is of uh, 3,000 people. Um, and, you know, it, Halloween is on a Sunday this year. And there's this interesting idea of a bifurcation of Halloween if it falls on a Sunday in some areas. Some people push the celebration to the 30th, which is Devil's Night in terms of the tricksterism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then like here in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I'm currently sitting, Halloween's when Halloween is. So I'm, I'm curious in terms of like, if there's any of the history there you might be able to um, illuminate for me uh, and also what your thoughts are on that bifurcation. That, that bifurcation, I actually just, this week became aware of some more extraordinary occurrences of that that I didn't even know about. Um, I have friends who live in areas of Ohio and Pennsylvania, and they casually mentioned in conversation the other night, well, we just had trick or treat Thursday night. And I'm, I was like, wait, you had what? Thursday night? What? What? Because I've heard of it being moved from a Sunday before um to a Saturday. That is a fairly common area of practice, I think, in areas that have more um, churches and more entrenched religion and so forth. I had never heard of it being moved to a Thursday night. And they said that their community had gone to that model because the idea was that they didn't want kids out on the streets on adult party nights. So that was interesting. There was also a move a few years ago to permanently move uh, Halloween celebrations to Saturday nights. Um, whatever the Saturday was closest to the actual day. And, and no big surprise here, that turned out to be actually driven by Spirit Halloween, this store thing, because they had discovered over the years that their best retail years were when Halloween fell on the Saturday. So it, it, it trick or treat has had some weird metamorphoses in these different regional areas moving to different days, depending on what the local ordinances are and so forth. I, I grew up in Southern California, I'm a lifelong Southern Californian, and, and it was almost unthinkable to me that it would be any day other than the actual 31st. But then again, I also know of areas where they practice it only during the daylight. Um, it was always a nighttime celebration here in California. Because um, I was driving in, you know, it was it was about five o'clock when I was driving in, and I saw some trick or treaters out, and I saw, you know, I saw some signs that I, I hadn't seen or paid attention to that um, people were trick or treating from noon to one today. I saw I saw some of that uh, advertised uh, on banners. Um, but yeah, I, did, I didn't see uh, as much as I thought. I didn't know if it was because it was still light out. Uh, I obviously, you know, I've spent the entire month sitting uh, in this room staring at this camera. So my, my relationship to what's going on outside in the world at night is somewhat skewed at this point. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm wondering how regional it is um, and, and how people are celebrating. It's, it has become very regional, which is interesting. Um, for example, here in LA, it's become a much more common practice to put your kids in the car and take them to a more affluent neighborhood on um, Halloween night to trick or treat. And um, this year, of course, is going to be a little bit like last year, where there will be places that don't want to participate because of the pandemic. 
Um, we visited today one of the neighborhoods that goes absolutely bonkers on Halloween is an area called Toluca Lake. And we drove through there today just to see what they were doing this year. And they had more houses that were decorating. In fact, the whole community had had a decorating contest, which was incredible. Um, but some of the houses actually had signs out that said, no candy, sorry, due to COVID, or um, please don't approach without a mask on, that kind of thing. So that's still very much a concern, at least here in California. And, and it's going to put a little bit of an odd side to things this year. One of the other recent developments that I, I also saw today when I was driving again, when I passed a park, was uh, people trunk or treating. Yeah, that's something that um, has become popular, especially with churches. Um, it, people, many people like that idea of the controlled trick or treat. Now they they feel safer with their kids, which is why you get the churches doing it. You get um, a lot of zoos. It's become a big business for zoos to do. They call it usually boo at the zoo. Um, and they'll have trick-or-treat stations along mixed in with the animal exhibits and so forth. And um, then, of course, there are even things like little pop-up festivals. We had one here in Southern California this month called Hauntoween that was really for kids. And it was, again, a controlled environment where you paid a charge to get into the whole festival. And it was had many stations along the way where kids could hold out their bag and get a treat. And that that some parents feel that that is safer they'd prefer that to the idea of going house to house um with people they may not know um one of the things i've been puzzling on and you were talking about you know carpenters 78 halloween in relationship to the adultification of halloween and i'm kind of curious about this because it seems that you lose some of the uh, the, the pan Europeanness where it's starting, right? Uh, and it, it seemed to solidify within the scope of American consumerism in the 19th century, moving into the 20th century. Um, in terms of like, I think of Halloween now sort of like having been imported into America now being re-exported out in an American way to the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, there are two trends that have driven its popularity as it has been exported around the world. Um, and I think the first one would surprise a lot of people. It's sitcoms. Mm. Um, our American sitcoms have been syndicated all over the world. Um, the Simpsons is a classic example. And when people in other countries watch these sitcoms, they see these Halloween episodes and they think it looks charming and they love the image of the kids dressed up and carrying these orange pumpkins. And then the second leg of this that comes in is quite often fast food marketing. McDonald's brings their Halloween Happy Meals to every McDonald's in the world. And, and again, here the kids are getting their, their Halloween Happy Meals in these little um, plastic treat collectors. So now they, they not only are seeing this on the sitcoms, but now they've got the actual treat collector at that point the community start getting together and you've got trick-or-treat happening now in a whole new area. In terms of Americana though, is the golden era of this nostalgic kids going door to door, is that past and has Halloween been turned into uh, an adult experience? It's certainly straddling an odd line right now. Um, yeah, the, the, there are still kids trick-or-treating it's still I think there are an estimated 40 million that are going to do it this year um, but it seems to have become as we mentioned earlier more regionalized it's like it's moved to these particular neighborhoods or these particular events unlike this sort of community gathering that it used to be and I think that is something that is that I would probably be nostalgic for it used to be so fun to go up and down your street at night and Another change that I find interesting is that when I was a kid, we did trick or treat, we went without the adults. And that was so magical because it was like the one night a year when you're not only dressed up as something that already empowers you, but you're doing it in this sort of environment of freedom. And the night is chilling and magical and you're approaching these houses that may have something scary hiding over here at the side of the porch but you conquer it and you get a reward for conquering it and 
those elements of it have been a little bit misplaced, I think, with the arrival of things like trunk or treat or daytime trick or treating. Um, also, I've noticed in my neighborhood, I don't get a lot of trick or treat. I do get some. I haven't seen a kid without a parent in years. So now it is definitely something where the children are accompanied by their parents. And that's, you know, I understand that. It's also a little bit sad. <laughs> I seem to remember too when I was younger. Um, I don't know. Costumes seem to be more better. I don't know. Uh, they, they're, they're. I mean, the, the advent of places like Spirit, right, have really kind of dumbed it down in some ways. You don't get the sort of homemade version very commonly. I mean, you you have one of the uh, plastic mold masks behind you, right? But you don't you don't get some of the more uh, ingenious creations uh, out and about so much anymore and you um, you just see endless repetitions more than anything. Somewhat although I also remember when I was a kid I was um, I loved making my own costumes and, and my parents were indulgent and would help me make these costumes and I was a bit uh, disdainful of the store-bought costumes and they were popular then too. Um, they were they looked a little bit different. They might, for example, if you had like a Dracula store-bought costume as a kid, it had the mask, but then it would have this polyester costume that would have like a silly cartoony drawing of a bat or Dracula or something on it. And I always thought those looked goofy. You know, they didn't, they didn't work for me as a somewhat bizarrely realistic child, I guess. <laughs> so. No, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, I, I just remember... Because when I was a kid, you know, QVC was coming into its own and stuff and running like these long specials with really elaborate stuff. And then um, you think like the Spencers, Spencers used to have really elaborate masks. And then there would be boutique stores that would pop up in the mall uh, as well. And I mean, malls are obviously dying as well. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, because it, it, it seems like places like Spirit or Halloween Express in some areas uh, have change that and i mean they, they they've made it more affordable in some ways right because but the quality seems to have also suffered quite a bit and I, I don't know if that's for better or for worse well uh, the spirit chain does have a somewhat homogenized selection of things i mean it's the same from store to store and and they're probably what maybe i don't i truthfully don't know how many different costumes they carry maybe a couple of hundred so yeah you you would probably expect given their overwhelming popularity to not see as many different costumes as you used to. And um, I always, I love going into the spirit stores every year to see what they're merchandising for costumes. Um, and I, I do see them make some interesting attempts. I was astonished this year by the Cheetos line of costumes. <laughs> but, I was shocked that they, they, they revived killer clowns from outer space this year was their big yeah, push. That was interesting. Yeah. Not one I would have thought. I mean, I don't know how many people have even seen that movie. Given the popularity of, of terrifying clowns, it probably didn't even matter. It was just, okay. easy, you know, it's probably a cheap license and an easy way to get more scary clowns into their, their line. So when do you think for being a kid then and trick-or-treating, when was the peak period? When was the best time to experience that? Well, I, I probably am prejudiced because I was doing it in the 60s and it was fantastic and I loved it. Um, but it does seem that the 60s was an interesting combination of elements for trick or treat. For one thing, um, what David Scal calls monster culture had come into popularity in the early 60s. And that, that kind of started, and I think it's 58, when Universal releases that huge syndicated package of their classic monster movies. The whole thing, I think, was called Shock Theater. And so suddenly you had these monster movies that were just saturating the few television channels we had at the time. And you had famous monsters of film land, the magazine, and kids were buying up the Aurora monster models. So you had this interesting um, collision between what was coming in in popular culture that was popular with kids in terms of horror and this holiday which by then had been pretty well established for 15 to 20 years. Um, and it 
seemed to make it sort of the best time. It also was before like the 1974 thing with Ronald O'Brien poisoning his kid with the pixie sticks. The, the first thing that set off the idea of the poison candy actually happened in 63, but it wasn't really until 74 with the O'Brien situation that that whole idea really got heavily into the American subconscious. And so probably I would say, I think from like maybe 60 to 74 was really that sort of golden period of, of trick or treat. So I missed it too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so your yard is currently a haunt. <laughs> yes. I um, wish I could turn my webcam around and show, although it's still light out here right now in California. So nothing is running quite yet, but we, we love doing it. Yeah. The, uh, the first haunt space that was deliberately constructed was in England in 1915. Um, but yeah, haunts, the idea of haunts and these attractions, you know, it, it has popularized quite a bit. You mentioned uh, Not Scary Farm in 73, uh, presumably trying to compete a little bit with um, the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland in 69. Yeah, the Haunted Mansion is, I, I kind of skipped over that in this particular presentation. But yeah, when they open, it, the Haunted Mansion is a huge impact. and And it's interesting if you read interviews or look at interviews with a lot of the professional haunters now and there are many who do this full time throughout the year um many of them will cite an early trip through the haunted mansion as their inspiration it, it was just a, a gigantically impactful on the future haunted attractions industry uh it, it's self-dependent largely another uh california icon the winchester house is uh <laughs> Certainly impactful to that. And also Shirley Jackson, of course, with The Haunting of Hill House and uh, sure. various film iterations, mostly The Haunting, um, yeah. picked up a lot in, uh, in particularly the original uh, version. And then a, a strong dose of the Southern Gothic, in that case, in Disneyland as well for the exterior. Right. Um, the other thing, too, in terms of... Uh, one of your icons you laid out was uh, the jack-o'-lantern, right? Um, and the jack-o'-lantern also seems to have a tie to uh, Will-o'-the-wisps as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, Will-o'-the-wisp and um, some of the legends of jack-o'-lantern all tie together into that same idea of the trickster. With the Will-o'-the-wisp, um, it was often a legend that was associated with these lights that were seen above marshy or swampy areas. And um, it's a natural phenomenon. It's, it's a thing that happens sometimes with these gases rising up out of these boggy places and forming these odd little sort of bluish fiery looking globes. But there were many legends about these things tricking people into their doom, leading them into the swampiest part where they drown, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, definitely tied into the Jack the trickster legends. Well, it's interesting too, because it's, I mean, the, the thing I don't think, I mean, you, you brought up the Jack, Stingy Jack legend, right? But Will too, I mean, it's, it's actually tied to masculine names. Like, I, th <laughs> right. I think that's something that people miss in these words, right? That they're actually tied to these these actual male names. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, in, so in, I, in the legends, Jack is a total reprobate. I mean, he's a gambler. He's a he's a drunk. He's a guy who just lazes around. And so, yeah, it's um. There's definitely a strong dose of toxic masculinity. In oh yeah, <laughs> and he somehow traps the devil in a tree yeah. <laughs> by carving crucifixes on the tree. Uh huh. It's and just... trapped him in what is it a coin case at one point that has the the cross on the cover of it and yeah yeah they're really you know, stories. there's a lot of iterations of that i mean most recently the film i trapped the devil um you've got the, the twilight zone episode where the guy has the little monk staff mm -hmm. um you know, uh, it, it, and so that that story actually perpetuates quite a bit uh, culturally. Um, yeah, yeah. Without sort of reference as to where it's coming from, which is right. even more fascinating. There are some really fun southern variants of it too, um, which are even sometimes transcribed in the in the dialect 
that they were told in and they're they're really interesting um i'm sad like after seeing your turnip pictures i, I want to carve a turnip next year I would love to, too. It's funny that in the first Halloween party guide, which is from 1897, it talks about carving jack-o'-lanterns. And pumpkin is just one of the things that it lists. It lists apples and cucumbers. I have yet to figure out how you could possibly carve an apple into a jack-o'-lantern. but Easier than a cucumber. That's true. Yes, you're right. So much moisture in it. but now that your pictures of i mean with the with the rope tied up on the top i quite liked that yeah yeah they also there's a very particular kind of um gourd over there that is specific to one area that's called something like the mangle wurzel and it's used as just a, a livestock feed but it also makes a fantastic um lantern it's bigger i guess even than a turnip and um, so there are some very specific areas in Britain that carve them from these gigantic mango wurzel things. <laughs> I don't know. It's something more like ah, uh, it, coming from the earth, right? It's more because <laughs> it's rooty. <laughs> so something about it seems more authentic. I don't know. <laughs> um, you mentioned Washington Irving and uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow, of course. Um, It's an interesting one because we we have so many iterations of it. I always tell students the Disney version is actually probably one of the best uh, that actually sticks closest to the text. Um, it is interesting because I was thinking about it when I was getting ready for this uh, discussion with you. I was thinking about it in relationship to it comes so much earlier than uh, like Dickens' Christmas Carol, right? It's 23 mm-hmm. years before Christmas Carol. So you do get this odd codifying of, yeah, uh, Americana and the ghost story and the jack o' lantern because it its function is the same in the story, right? It's a prank, right? Right, and it, it's also interesting to compare to his other supernatural classic, of course, um, uh, Rip Van Winkle. Um, they both have this sort of interesting upper New York State autumnal feel that they capture really well. A sense of magic going on at that time and in that place, and even though it's um, a prank in um, Sleepy Hollow, unlike Rip Van Winkle, it's, it's a prank that is left ambiguous at the end, which is interesting. Um, it's told from Ichabod's point of view, and when Ichabod is on his notorious ride at the end, he's being pursued by what he, he thinks is a ghost, and it hurls its severed head at him, and yet the morning after this story just sort of Riley comments on they never found Ichabod they found a a smashed pumpkin Um, so you know what the head was but you could also conceivably read the story as completely supernatural which is interesting as well about it and he definitely hallucinates if nothing else (laughs) the Disney version confuses people because the Disney version talks about Halloween a lot So people, when you tell them there is no mention of it in the original story, they're like, oh, yes, there is. No, really, there's not that Disney included that in their cartoon version, which is very good. Well, I mean, it's it's, it's the harvest dance he goes to where he angers Brom Bones. I mean, the guy's name is Bones, for God's sake. Uh, my favorite line uh, in that sequence, when because Ichabod is actually, he's like obsessed with scary stories. He actually forgets to go teach and stuff because he's reading uh, horror stories and falls asleep reading them. Um, but my favorite uh, line, which again is very ambiguous and depends how you take it, is uh, he believed himself to be as fine of a dancer as he was a singer. <laughs> right, yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, so that's, that's my favorite line from uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, it's, it's a great story. It's really fun to read. Um. Yeah, I mean, but it is a truth. Of course, uh, actually, in 1850, we get uh, John Leaf Whitaker's uh, poem, The Pumpkin, as mm-hmm. well, uh, which is much closer to a jack o' lantern as we would think of it now, too. Yeah, although, again, no direct in, uh, reference to Halloween, but it definitely feels like it should be a Halloween poem. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's this, uh, this nostalgic thing. 
Um, and then, of course, I mean, one of the traditions that seems to tie to this, apart from pumpkins, is the bobbing for apples. <laughs> right. Yeah. The bobbing uh, for apples is interesting because it's it's one of the oldest traditions that we know about related to Halloween. Um, we can trace it back to, I think it's the 11th century illuminated manuscript known as the Luttrell Psalter, um, which shows people bobbing for apples. And um, so we know it's a game that's been around forever, and it probably comes from the Celts have somewhat of a veneration for apples. Um, of course, they're also a harvest food in the autumn. Um, and in, in Ireland and Scotland, they made played many interesting and odd variants of bobbing for apples. One was called snap apple, and in snap apple, the apple was actually hung from a string overhead. Oh, yeah. I can only imagine that that didn't survive and make it to America because of the number of lost teeth. <laughs> I think I've played this. Really? I, it's like it hangs like a pinata, and you're you're blindfolded, and you're yeah. I think I think I did this once. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, <laughs> if I didn't, I've hallucinated it in my memory somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten it until this exact moment that you're saying it. Um, so let, let me ask you some more generic questions here in the, in the last few minutes uh, I, I have you for. Um, what traditions for Halloween would you like to see the return uh, or would you like to see pushed further than people have been doing them? What, how would you like to see Halloween evolve? Um, well, one, one tradition I think that sounds like so much fun and, and that we don't do anymore were the fortune telling games that they are described, for example, in the Robert Burns poem Halloween from 1785. They sound really fun. Um, some of them are actually quite macabre, things like going out to a field. Obviously, that's a little difficult for most of us, but going out to a field and drawing a rake across the um, the the agriculture there and calling out on the devil to come and tell you things. And um, some of them were much simpler and more charming, like setting a series of nuts across the hearth and whichever one cracked would indicate your future in some way. And they, those, I actually have considered holding a party that would be nothing but the traditional fortune telling games. And, um, but in terms of how I actually see it going, I think we are going to see Halloween mesh more and more with regional cultures. Um, here in my part of Southern California, we are already seeing a lot of Dia de los Muertos coming in to Halloween. Um, I was noticing, for example, at our local uh, Party City store, right next to like the section on costumes from the Purge was the section on costumes of Dia de los Muertos which was amazing to me that that's now standing right alongside the heavily marketed Hollywood properties. And um, we are also seeing it start to happen in other areas, like for example, in Hong Kong, uh, there's a big amusement park there called Ocean Park. And Ocean Park has been doing Halloween mazes successfully for several decades now. They did one in 2019 that was based on the 18 levels of Buddhist hell. Um, and I find that cultural mashup incredibly fascinating and i suspect that's how we're going to see halloween continue to evolve as it expands around the globe well i mean the hell house has been around right since 1974 sure yeah <laughs> um yeah I'm, I'm just i'm curious where it goes uh you know it also seems interesting because horror right um both literary horror horror studies horror films right they've they're not seasonal anymore right no you're you're absolutely right about that and in fact leslie Bannatine, who i mentioned writing the first really great history in 1990 modern history of a holiday um wrote a book a few years ago called halloween culture that discussed how it has infiltrated so many areas of pop culture now that have nothing to do with seasonal celebrations that you're finding it in everything from music to fashion to tattooing to um, this, yes, in, in horror, in the fact that some of the haunts are not only segueing into other holidays, but possibly going year round. Now, some of that was seriously impacted by the pandemic, and, and I'm still kind of waiting to see 
what happens once, if ever, <laughs> we move past this. Um, if the more haunts at that point will become financially successful enough again to look at year-round operations, it seems like that might be a direction that we're going. Um, it was also interesting last year, I was kind of waiting to see what some of the big haunted attractions were going to do if they were going to try virtual models. And I didn't see that happening, but I saw drive-through attractions mm -hmm. were big. So, and that was something a lot of families liked. Um, they liked being able to pack everybody into one car and drive them through this fun, scary environment. And that might be something again that we'll see becoming more part of it as it moves into the future yeah there was, there was a haunted car wash in town here this year <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> um no i think i mean the other thing i guess i want to ask you all about is the because you know, juan and i were talking about this today it feels like halloween has already happened it's feeling like it's already over because um i think the first halloween stuff i started seeing maybe in michael's or something it was july I yeah. started seeing it and then you know august spirit halloween was open um but now you know i was at michael's the other day because i have to keep buying black candles uh and uh you know it, it's been overtaken by christmas for a while now and i went to the store today and i couldn't actually find like pumpkin cookies like for us to have in the studio tonight uh but they had like you know uh, Italian Christmas cakes and things already out. And I'm just like, it's it's October, everybody. Yeah, that retail wheel keeps moving faster and faster every year, it seems like. Um, and this year was an odd Halloween for the stores. On top of that thing, which has been going on for a while, the supply chain issues. Um, I mean, here in LA, we are very used to going to the spirit stores in August and they and many of them were not even open by September. Um, they were uh, experienced, and the ones that were open would often be only like a third stocked, and they would have signs up that would say "coming soon" and so forth. So, yeah, this was a just an odd year all the way around for everything. I think. Yeah, I didn't know if it was just coincidental that people were trying to make up for last year's lost profits, and that's why it was pushed. But I mean, Christmas definitely has pushed its way back into the season. And so yeah. I feel like there's a, a tug of war. There is no Thanksgiving anymore, right? Fall ends tonight. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Poor Thanksgiving. Um, I guess it's the ultimate Halloween casualty. I, I mean, you know, th Thanksgiving was created during the Civil War. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm confused as to where it's going to end up because of this like the uh, like and you know like you you mentioned like mickey's not so scary uh and things like that you know they start in august too like that, that those parties started at the end of august um universal's halloween horror nights i think started at the end of august this year um and so i don't know if people just get fatigued in some ways too i certainly get christmas fatigue Right. <laughs> I don't know. I suspect that if there was a serious problem with Halloween fatigue, we wouldn't see them starting earlier every year, it seems like. Yeah, maybe. So let me ask you one last question here. Uh, give us a recommendation of what we should read and what we should watch to celebrate Halloween. Um, reading, of course, we've got to look at Ray Bradbury. Um the Halloween tree is the one that's probably most directly related to Halloween, but I also love um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, which has a really, really solid, like, Halloween, autumnal feel to it. Um, and there's also a wonderful book by Norman Partridge called Dark Harvest that came out about 15 years ago. It's one of my favorite sort of more modern pieces of Halloween fiction. Uh, in terms of something that's really cool to watch, um, obviously Michael Doherty's Trick or Treat is great. It's a it's such a cool little anthology film. Um, and I also have I have a, a real like guilty pleasure affinity for Halloween three season of the witch. Yes. Yeah. I mean, which is possibly the first film to mention Salad, even though they wildly mispronounced it, but it's such just strange, weird fun halloween movie i i really enjoy that one too i'm so glad you said that 
because <laughs> I'm obsessed with Halloween three. Um, no, you you made my made my day by saying Halloween three. I watched the I, I watched the Fog this morning for another John Carpenter, uh, yeah. which is quickly becoming one of my favorite horror movies. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, and uh, giving us your presentation on Halloween and talking to us a little bit about the history and uh, where Halloween's going. I want to invite everybody to switch over to Twitch if you're not already on Twitch for our streaming of Werner Herzog's 1979 version of Nosferatu, uh, which will be airing here uh, in a few minutes. And also to take the survey that Juan has dropped in the various chats and to tune in tomorrow night for Dr. Laura Westengard's presentation because we're not done with spooky season here yet. Uh, take that, Christmas. Uh, <laughs> going to start coming your way <laughs> um but yeah uh, everybody have a great halloween Samhain, all hollows whichever you prefer it uh eat some candy don't break your teeth chomping at apples uh and stay spooky <laughs> yes absolutely happy halloween happy Samhain, happy all saints and all saints day and happy digitalis um are you expecting a ton of trick-or-treaters you know, I wish. We do this yard haunt, I think, really mainly for ourselves, but we're in a cul-de-sac. We're in a neighborhood where nobody else even does so much as put out a pumpkin. We get families who come every year who know about us. Now, the pandemic, of course, put a cap on that last year. We don't know. We're interested to see if any show up this year. So we'll, we'll cross our fingers that we get a few kids whose parents force them to pose with the gravestones and the ghosts. So let me ask you something. <laughs> Um, the credits are rolling over our face right now. Um, so we're planning to uh, pre-record for next year, um, so we can actually enjoy the season <laughs> rather than sitting in an office talking to a camera. Uh, and one of the themes we're actually looking to do is Halloween three at forty. Oh, cool! Would you be interested in doing a Halloween three talk? Yeah, I'd love to actually. Awesome. I don't, I don't know if you know that I have a, an association with the Vermont who did the effects on that. Oh, um, really? My, my first major writing credit was a movie in 1988 called Meet the Hollowheads that I co-wrote with Tom Berman. And Tom okay. did it, and I was one of the associate producers. And so I, I know a lot about Halloween 3 on those effect sides. And um, I can get probably even more anecdotes from Tom. Tom is retired now. He's living in Santa Barbara. And he doesn't do a lot of events, but I'll bet I could get some fun stuff out of it.